This is the sixth in a series of videos that I'm making to support a course in number theory. So we just got done talking about GCDs and the Euclidean algorithm. Now we're ready to talk about prime numbers. So we say P, which is bigger than one and a natural number is prime if its only divisors are one and P. Then furthermore, a number which is not prime is called composite. Now today we want to work up towards the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, starting with the following lemma. I'll call it lemma one. And that is every natural number bigger than one can be written as a product of primes. You might worry a little bit, what about the number one? It doesn't seem to be composite or a prime. And you would be correct in saying that it is neither. It is in fact a unit. So in other algebraic structures, there are lots more units than just the number one or the number one and minus one if you're considering the integers. So while one is playing a unique role as the only unit in the natural numbers, like I said, in other algebraic structures, there are many more units. So we'll start with the first case, which is totally trivial, and that is n equals p, which is a prime. But in this case, we're already done, and that's because we've written n as a product of primes. In fact, it's just the product of a single prime. It's like kind of an empty product. So like I said, we're done here. Okay, so now we'll move on to case two. So case two is that n is not prime. But in the case when n is not prime, we're gonna do this by induction. So let's suppose for all k which lie between 2 and n, this result holds. So what do I mean by this result? I mean that all of these k can be written as the product of primes. Okay. But now, since we're assuming that n is composite, that means that we can write n as a times b, where a and b lie between 2 and n. But that means we can apply the induction hypothesis to a and b. So in other words, we can write a as p1 up to pr, and b as q1 up to qs, where pi and qj are all primes. Great. But putting this all together, we have n is equal to p1 up to pr times q1 up to qs. In other words, it's a product of primes. That finishes the proof of this lemma. Okay, so now let's move on to another lemma. Now we're ready for our second lemma. So we want to start with the prime p and then a collection of natural numbers a1 through am. And what we will show is if p divides the product of a1 up to am, then p divides aj for at least one of the j between 1 and m. And this is a really important property of prime numbers. Okay, so let's maybe dive into the proof. Proof, we'll do this uh, via induction again. And our base case will start with m equals two. It's not super interesting if we have m equals one. Okay, so let's maybe go ahead and suppose p divides a times b. So here I'll write a and b instead of a1 and a2, just for ease of use. Okay, so now let's break this into two cases. So case number one is P divides A, but in this case we're already done because P divides one of them. So that means we need to move on to case two, which is P does not divide A. But if P does not divide A, given the fact that P is a prime, that means that the GCD of A and P is equal to one, Remember that the only divisors of P are one and P, but this says that P can't divide A, so that means one is the only common divisor. Okay, so let's rewrite that as GCD of A, P is equal to one. But then we know that we can write the GCD as a linear combination. So in other words, 
there exist x and y, which are integers, such that ax plus py is equal to 1, like that. And then from here, we'll take this equation and multiply it by b. Because remember, if p doesn't divide a, we probably want to end up with p dividing b. So let's see what that'll give us. So we'll have a times bx plus p times by is equal to b. Okay, great. But now let's notice here, we've got the product a times b. We know that the product a times b is divisible by p. So this means a times b is equal to np for some n. Okay, so now let's insert that down here. We have n times p times x plus p times b times y equals b. We can factor a p out of the left-hand side, leaving us with p times the quantity nx plus by is equal to b. But this equation is exactly what we need to say that p divides b. Okay, so we've done our base case. Now we're ready to move on to our induction hypothesis and our induction step. Okay, we finished our base case. Now we're ready to look at our induction hypothesis and our induction step. So let's suppose that we know if P divides A1 up to AK, then that means that P divides AJ for some J. So that will be our induction hypothesis. Now we wanna take our induction step, which is considering the next setup. So let's maybe go ahead and suppose that P divides A1 up to AK times AK plus 1. And here's how you want to think about this in terms of the induction or in terms of the base case. So we want to think that A equals A1 up to AK and B is equal to AK plus 1, like that. Okay, so applying that base case, we see that this means that P divides A1 up to AK or P divides AK plus 1. Again, that's like from our base case argument. But now we can imply the induction hypothesis to this statement right here. This means that P divides AJ for some J between 1 and K or P divides AK plus 1. But now if we put that all together, that tells us that P divides AJ for some J between 1 and K plus 1, which is exactly what we need to finish this proof. Okay, let's get rid of this and now we're ready to tackle the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Now we're going to look at the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. We have already shown that numbers that are bigger than 1, which are also natural numbers, can be factored into primes. So all that's left to show is that that factorization is unique up to permutations. And by that I mean permuting the prime factors. For example, 15 can be factored as 3 times 5 or 5 times 3, but those are the same up to permutation. Okay, so let's maybe see how we can do this. So we'll do this with induction, again, on the size of n, which is bigger than 1. So let's go ahead and suppose for all k between 1 and n, not including 1 and not including n, the statement holds. So what I mean by the statement is that the factorization into primes is unique up to some sort of permutation. So next, let's take n and factor it into primes two different ways. So we can do that by writing n as p1 up to pr and also as q1 up to qs. And this is gonna be for pi and qj primes. And at the moment, we do not suppose that they are permutations of each other. And here, we're not even supposing that we have the same number of prime numbers. Okay, so now let's notice that p to the r most definitely divides n. That's because p to the r times all of this stuff is equal to n by our kind of assumption. 
but that means that P sub R divides this product Q1 up to QS. But PR is prime, so we can apply that previous lemma to say that PR divides QJ for some J. And that J is between 1 and S. But now PR and QJ are both primes. But if one prime divides another, that means they have to be equal. So we can summarize that as saying that PR is, in fact, equal to QJ. But now we want to consider this new number. So I'll call this new number N prime, which will be this product P1 up to PR minus 1. So in fact, it's N divided by PR. But expressed in terms of the Q primes, this is going to be Q1 all the way up to QJ, all the way up to QS, but we will remove QJ. So we can notate that by putting a hat over it. So that's the product Q1 up to QS, but we've removed QJ. So notice that N prime is strictly less than N, so that means we can apply the induction hypothesis to it. So when we apply the induction hypothesis to it, that means that this list right here, P1 up to PR minus 1, and this list right here, Q1 up to QS, excluding QJ, are permutations of each other. So I'll just write these are permutations of each other. But now if these two lists are permutations of each other, then that clearly implies that these two products are also permutations of each other. And that's what we need in order to finish this proof. So let's finish off with this corollary which easily follows from the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. And that is if we can write A and B as the product of these powers of primes, P1 to the R1 up to PK to the RK, P1 to the S1 up to PK to the SK, where PI is not equal to PJ, and RI and SJ are bigger than or equal to zero. So that means there may be some primes on this list which are not on this list, given the fact that we can just use a zeroth power. Then the GCD of AB is P1 to the minimum of R1, S1, up to PK to the minimum of RK, SK. Then the LCM, the least common multiple of these two numbers, has a similar structure except we have the maximum of R1, S1, and the maximum of RK, SK. So let's look at a quick example here. So if we have 3,444, we can factor that into primes as 2 squared times 3 times 7 times 41. And then let's see, this is 244,496, which can be factored into primes as 2 to the 4 times 7 times 37 times 59. Then using this corollary up here, we can easily find the GCD and the LCM. The GCD is 2 squared times 7. That's obviously equal to 28. And that's because they share prime factors of 2 and 7, but nothing else. Then the LCM is 2 to the 4 times 3 times 7 times 37 times 41 times 59 for the same kind of reason here. And I'll let you guys calculate this number if you really want to. Okay, so let's get rid of this and then we're going to put some warm-up exercises before the next class. So here's some warm-up problems to turn in if you're in the class. If you're obviously not in the class, you can do these if you want to or not. So the first one is to find all the prime factors of these two numbers. We've got 7,290,000 and 23 factorial. Next, we've got a divisibility problem, which thinking that this is from the section of the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, you might want to use that fundamental theorem of arithmetic. And we want to show that if a cubed divides b squared, then a divides b. Next, we want to show that n factorial cannot end in 154 zeros. 